So hello everyone. Um, it's been a while since I've been at the main stage of a European XML event. I was surprised when I actually went and checked to find it was 1999 in Granada. Anyone at XML Europe in 1999? A few. Yeah, so I, I think I did a presentation then when I was predicting that it's good to store XML on your web server and use an XML API in the middle and then use XML in the browser, you know, so you could get rich events, interactions, and rendering from it. But it just shows what I know, I suppose, but there we are. Um, so, happy to be here. Um, big long title, which could really be summed up as saying, I wanted to see if you could do cool things to Microsoft Word documents, but not using Microsoft technologies for standard use cases, okay? So why did I bother trying to develop this solution? Well, unlike many people in this room, I'm not very good at learning. Yep. Okay, no? Thanks. I'm not very good at learning from specs. I'm a very hands-on learner. I like to have a concrete problem, something I understand that I can go at and try to fix using my knowledge of the problem and my knowledge of the technology and put it together. <coughs> And to be honest, I've been really dying to do a good XSLT3 project or practice to, to really up my skills in those areas. But the companies I work with, mostly publishers, um, they have in-house XML developers who tend to use the same sort of technologies they do, and they basically are not using XSLT3. So as it was with XSLT2, I need to go in and I need to promote to them the benefits of using the new version of XSLT to get them over the any humps that they have in terms of their knowledge, uh, the fact they change, they don't like change from one thing to the next. But to be honest, I didn't feel comfortable to do that when I myself had not done extensive projects using XSLT3. So I needed an XSLT3 project. In terms of pipelining, so I have used XPROC 1 with Galbash extensions to do some quite simple things, some style sheet chaining, some validation and movement files here or there. But nothing as complex as, for instance, some of the ant pipelines that have developed over the years or the DTOT customizations. So again, I thought, well, a project where I can take that information and sort of combine it together. So why choose Word documents if I'm going to do a project on them? Well, I, I while we can do lots of interesting things with XML, I mean, XML's popularity, I mean, really now is focused on documents. You talk to the API people, they really don't want to know. So, something document-based, it's also my expertise. <coughs> and Microsoft Word is, of course, out there being used by corporate users. By corporate users, I'm not talking about corporate publishers, I'm talking about legal firms, large consultancies, people who create enormous documents, government. Okay, so I can't, I can't hear what I'm saying. From there, so okay. Let's try that. Too much. Okay, here we go. Thank you. So Microsoft Word, as everyone here knows, uh, uses OpenOffice XML or Office Open XML. I always get confused. Um, you know, and processing Word is often complex because it's such a flat structure, but we want to do rich things with it. It's got difficult mechanisms for encoding its styling and its information. It's all packed up within a docx, which is, as you know, just a zip. And so it was going to give us an interesting challenge and interesting things to do. So the use case that I wanted to look at is all about the quality and consistency of, of styles, okay? We can see in the left-hand side some contract that I signed at some point or, or the other. But, you know, you get the standard sections, numbering, sub-numbering. And legal companies, for example, we'll use it as an example, are very concerned that these are created in the right way, in a consistent way. So all the sections are present that have to be there. All the sections have got the correct titles. The branding is very important. So when they're working with you know, large companies, they want every part of the document to be perfectly styled, professional looking result. And the numbering is, of course, really, really important because the numbering can affect the legal meaning and interpretation of the document. Because if you say, you're going to get paid, apart from all the reasons in section four, if section four is actually section five, or there's two section fours, then that really 
affects things. And getting this sort of stuff right is, is really a struggle. You know, and I think lots of us who have worked in publishing have faced that struggle when trying to convert from, from one thing to the next. So why do things go wrong with styles? I know we've all used Word and we've all probably hated it and kicked it at various times. It's just basically it's so flexible, you can do anything. You know, they could have a style bar, which you can pick from, but you can also use Format Painter to copy styles from one place to the next. You can copy and paste from one document to the next. And as you do it, you're not only transferring the text, you're polluting your document with the styles and formatting and definitions from the other document, which have then a knock-on effect. Of course, you can manually format, manually number, You can even go and take your, your corporate styles and just update them with any styling you've already applied, making things then worse for anyone else who comes to the, doc and do the document later and adds those content with those styles. When it comes to numbering, it gets even worse. You get to these complex auto numbers, which if you ever go inside, you can see you've got N levels of heading all linked to different styles. And if you don't use the styles, you don't get the numbering. But you sort of do get the numbering. You get some numbering, but is it the right numbering? And outside of the XML world, there are some solutions for this. It tends to be custom templates, template management systems, which try to force you to use the right template. Macros, Visual Basic, custom ribbon toolbars to try to force some behavior into a user. But the user typically doesn't understand why they can't just do the things in Word that they want to do. And actually, they almost certainly can do the things that they want to do. They just completely override whatever custom user interface is provided to them. And there's very little feedback from these, these things. You're just forced to do a thing or something's hidden away and it just leads to, to, to difficult scenarios. So, so I visited in a previous occupation about 30 major legal firms in the UK and found that they've got very interesting dynamic between the people who, who, who work there with, to do with documents. You've got users who can write the content, understand the content, but don't really understand styles, definitely don't understand IT. You've got knowledge workers who are like librarians of styles who really do understand that stuff, but they're not programmers and they're not developers. Then you go to the development section, if there is one, well, they don't want to waste their time doing stuff with Word when they've got proper development to be doing. And IT people are just busy updating operating systems and don't really understand style sheets. So these solutions tend to f fail at the time. The number of times I've turned up somewhere where there'd be a front sheet which has got their old address because they can't change the templates because they can't change the macros because then they can't change the user interface. It all gets completely ridiculous. So can we do better? What about a standards-based solution which would allow people to manage styles in the template, use Word out of the box, and provide suggestions back to users in a language you can understand in order to find the rules for style and content. Well, anyone in publishing has had to use, look at Word within a Word XML workflow, okay? Some of the people originate the information in Word, it goes through different iterations, at some point it spits out Word XML, it goes into some XSLT, it creates XML, usually it's wrong, then goes back, just because you know, we're trying to map lists of things and groups to other things and special elements to pieces of metadata. And all that XML has to be enhanced and then God help us has to go back to Word again because somebody wants to do a major change and you start all over again. And that leads to things being broken and inefficient. But there are and have been solutions. So, particular solution I'm going to show you today, I didn't invent, so Andrew Sales, sitting at the front, presented this, uh, or a version of this in 2017 at XML London. And with this we can use Schematron to analyse the XML within the Word document, so you're still originating in Word, it's still creating XML, but this time we put it through Schematron, we get the reporting language uh, response out, which provides XPath into the data, it provides descriptions of the error, we pump it back into Word as comments, because that's how we can interact with the user without breaking the document itself. The users will then see the document. So I'm just going to show a little quick demo of, of validation. 
because I wanted to rewrite this, not to use the same approach as we had before, which was a multi-step approach. Um, where basically you write an XSLT to write an XSLT, but I want to do some more dynamic features. So here we have a small Word document, which is small but imperfectly formed. Go from heading ones to heading threes, manual formatting, and uh, the cursor at the moment is flashing on a, a legal clause with a legal number, which you can see from the style is normal. It's not a cause style. It's not using proper numbering. And if you wanted to use further numbering, it's all going to break. So I've run an XPROC. So I've run an XPROC and I've created a. Okay. Testing, testing. No? It's okay now. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Okay, so now we get the document back. We can see down the left hand side, um, it's got these errors. The errors, we've got an original comment passed through. The first one in red, it's an error. It says heading three must be immediately preceded by a heading two, and it's not. That's just a rule. Of course, the rule is arbitrary. It's been defined in Schematron. You can have as many Schematron rules as you want. Then we have different users, which are warning users, which are advising that inline italic formatting is not allowed. Um, that an old style, which is no longer supported in the more, most modern template, should not be used. And the third one's quite interesting. So it says this para seems to have a manual number one. Consider replacing using styles. So it's spotted that it's found the number found that it's not an auto number, and then suggested that they should have a fix. So if I change the program to use a bit more of a, a meaty document, We'll hopefully see that we can get enormous amounts of errors, which is, of course, was just in this test document. It can say things like it can match on errors which are not actually in the content. So the first auto-generated piece of text says that the style file itself, the very style definition, is out of date and contains an old style definition which should no longer be used. So that's not something you can change by typing in the document. That's actually a sort of something wrong under the, the surface. But that's still, that's been identified by Schematron. We have a style here, new para style, which is using the old style. And basically the author could go through, finding each error, manually fixing it, even down to something where some style person has decided that everything in the list must have a semicolon, the second last one must have an and, and on and on and on. Of course, wouldn't it be better if we could actually do more? So these are the rules that we have in Schematron. So in this case, we're matching on a, a word paragraph, a P. I provided a library of helper functions, which can do things like finding manual numbering, getting suggested styles, which might use that manual numbering, and then feeding the text back to the user. These can be developed by someone who's a bit of an expert, like us, or in theory, once someone gets into the pattern understanding of these, they can be customized and changed according to an organizational level. I said I wanted to get into XPROC. Well, this is a simplification of the XPROC pipeline, where we've got the inputs of being the master template to compare to, the docx, which is the document, the number of steps we go through, unloading, unzipping, wrapping, unwrapping, running schema tron, getting the result back, getting the SVRL, combining the comments, et cetera, et cetera. And so now, if anyone wants to ask me about XPROC, I think I'm there. Just as it's changing to XPROC 3. Never mind, that'll be fine. As I said, we wanted to do a bit more. Rather than just 
tell people what's wrong, why not get fixes in? So we know about quick fix, again, things from the open standards. We get good ideas, quick fix allows you to identify an error and then have it fixed. So maybe we could do the same thing. Rather than just use quick fix, I actually wanted to take a slightly different approach whereby we could dynamically run functions to do useful things, almost like in an event-like way, based on the comments as you find in the document. So let's just do a little demo again. So this time I'm going to run the tool, but with a, a mode which says, please add fixes. Okay, and this time we've got a new user called fix with comments in there. And again, the user could go through most of the fixes, they're going to be single point fixes, they don't have to make any choice. But the good thing about Schematron is sometimes there's ambiguous circumstances. So for instance, we can come in, it says um, the head two must be immediately preceded by something else. So fixes, change the head two to heading one, or change it into uh, normal, or change, change it into, uh, change the other thing into heading two. So what I'll do is I'll delete the ones I don't want. I mean, this document does look pretty, pretty awful now, but I'll leave it there. So there's now only one fix for that error. I'll save that document. Again, rerun the tool. The reason I'm just changing all these parameters was because I don't want to t have to type during a, a demo. Okay, and we can see in the trace here, although you probably can't see from there, it's actually just saying it's running functions. And I'll show you what those, those functions equated to fixes, which were assigned in the comment, which were left in the document. Those functions are being run dynamically, which is something we can do with XSLT3. And when we look at the resulting output document, we can now see there's very few comments because after we've fixed it, we ran it through Schematron again. I've left one warning still in there just to show that it has been validated. The document now, the Paris style, which was um, called old style one before, has not only been stop swapped to be called style one, but it's actually swapped over the underlying numbering and style sheets behind the Word document from the master template in order that it's now being rendered correctly in red. It's changed the inline style, which wasn't allowed. It's gone through the list of bullets, putting semicolons and ands in, whether it's numeric or otherwise. And it's changed the clauses to proper clauses, which I think is fairly impressive. So these fixes, I didn't have time to actually implement quick fix exactly, so I didn't want to give it a quick fix namespace or markup. Um, so I added my own little namespace and markup, but it's basically the same thing. Within the Schematron rule, you just define what the fix is. In this case, there's a couple of fixes. The first fix being remove manual number, so it's an action. That action is going to become a function or call to a function. The function's kept in a function library. Developers can add functions to the function library at any time without changing the core code or even the core XSLT code. It will be checked whether it's available and ran if it is. This one simply removes the manual number, so it's always going to um, run a function which then cascades down through the content, dropping what's necessary. 
The second choice is affixes. Basically, I went through a list of the style names which might be associated. Um, so basically, what it did is it, it found the numbering scheme, like 1.2.a bracket, checked the master style sheet to say, well, what, numbering, well, what styles are there which invoke numbering schemes which match that pattern? Because that's probably what should have been used. There might be one or two. There might be an appendix numbering scheme and a, a main body numbering scheme. And this would go through and dynamically list all of the alternatives. It would call a function called change style, and it would pass an argument, which is the name of the style that the user wants to change to. And that all gets encoded in the comment, and then exec and run. And you see this is all done dynamically. So no one's having to even program saying, if you see this numbering scheme, then swap to this style, because again, that could get out, out of date. And that's what these traditional old approaches always used to fall over for, because the code couldn't keep up with the flexibility of the style sheet. So what did I learn? Because I said right from the start, this is as much about me learning as developing a tool to, to, give, to, give, to give to users. Um, well, if you're going to dynamically call functions using XSL Evaluate, then you need to use uh, Saxon P or E, not H-E, but that's fair enough. Um, one thing which I lost some sleep over for at least one night was that everything seemed to be working fantastically, and I was calling, is the function available? And I was saying, yes, I found your function. I'm going to dynamically call it. And then it couldn't find it and fall over, not, not work. Or it would try and catch and caught. And that's because you need to mark all the functions you call as having visibility of public, which is something new to XSLT3 for packaging, etc. cetera. Um, when you call and evaluate, if you're passing in named parameters, so you're calling my function uh, dot current context, some x path to something else, that's all fine. But then you're referencing some variable that you want to pass in. You also need to then reference that variable with a, within a with param, or again, get an error. Maybe someone can explain to me why afterwards, but we'll leave that for now. Obviously, dynamically calling anything or running anything, you need to make sure that you're not going to end up exposing your innards by then running a document function. So when I get these magical um, function names, I always attach a namespace, and that namespace will then mean you can only run one of the defined sets of functions. Uh, I make sure the arguments, other than the current context, are all just strings, or strings could be cast as ints and not, not anything, um, anything else more like other functions, for instance. What else? Xproc. Xproc. Well, I mean, I loved working with Xproc 1, but Xproc 3, please, as soon as possible. Um, I think Norman, etc., will see that at the Xproc uh, on conference day, I had my hand up about what, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. But the good news was almost everything that I raised as being an annoyance, a difficulty, like variables with wrapped within groups. Um, lack of parameters, they're all have been addressed. And so they're all coming. And this will make Xbox 3 so much easier, efficient, and concise to write with, as we found. The other thing I found hard is someone asked a question about what's a good starter resource. There's a few bits and pieces on the web if you don't want to read the standard. But as soon as you start getting into extensions and things like zip and unzip, there's very few examples, and the documentation is, is pretty darn poor. But we're getting a book. Another mention for the book. I think it's... Some so that's all good as well. By far, the most annoying thing is all XML itself, I mean, and, and words treatment of it. Any small, slightest thing you get wrong, and then computer says no, it just won't open. Or it will say, I can try and fix this, but I'm not going to try and I'm not going to tell you what's wrong with it. And you know, whether it's the actual anything within the syntax within a file or the interactions between a comment and a comment extension and a comment reference. It gets very complicated. But once you've got it working, it's kind of fine. I don't know if I've raced through this a bit quickly, but there we are. Um, so in terms of the conclusions, so I think there is no technical reasons why tools like Xproc, especially Xproc 3, XSLT, 3, um, Schematron, 
cannot be used to solve difficult corporate world use cases. There are people out there, large corporations doing things which cost them a lot of money and they're struggling. You've got people in legal offices up to midnight between the big deal trying to patch together documents that are breaking and they don't understand why. They just try to do everything they can to try and fix it. Typically taking it all out as text, pasting it back in again, then reformatting it from scratch. Can you imagine? I think the difficulty will be around limitations of the technical staff to learn and use the technologies, which is why if the technologies get better, the more learning resources we can put together for cookbooks using of XPROC, of um, presentations such as seen today about you know, some of the things you can do with XSLT3. I think a great presentation would be things you can do in XSLT3 that you couldn't do before, but you know, real practical use cases. But I think the biggest challenge is definitely going to be just trying to get over to staff who are not used to using our sort of tools, who'd much rather go and hack some .NET, hack a toolbar, and try to get around things. There are different ways to work, declarative ways to, to, to you know, declare rules, have them assessed with things like Schematron, and keep that code, that thing which lives and breathes and changes a lot, away from the heavy duty document processing code that would actually fix the problem. I have one more sort of a mini conclusion. That's, that's a picture of an old dog and he's about to do a new trick. So back to the learning thing. So if you read my paper when it's finally published, you'll see that I say I run these functions using XSL Evaluate. And that works perfectly fine and is very neat and works, you know, does the job. But when I went to the Saxonica um, help page for XSL Evaluate, it said, before you use this, consider using higher order functions. Okay. So I thought, oh dear, well, Michael says it, then I better consider using higher order functions. So I went to the spec and I had cast my eye over higher order functions and I sort of glazed over before and quickly. So I went back and I thought, well, let's try and find some examples of things that I sort of do with documents and things documented with higher order functions. And to be honest, I gave up and moved on. But then this morning, the gentleman in the front, front row, um, he also showed the use of a higher order function to dynamically run something. And so underneath, here's my first use of a higher order function. Function lookup as an alternative for Excel, Excel Evaluate. Basically, we've got a variable, the name of the function, the namespace already added to it, the number of args, test if it exists, run it, or return an empty sequence. Okay? It's massively, power, massively powerful, runs my functions, my functions do the thing, and then iterates on each other. I always, I always pass the current context and the original context, because maybe the function will delete the element, throw it away, create a new element, put something in it, and then the next function is going to do something with that. So you, you always want the context. And while we were talking this morning, I implemented that, and it just works. So that's one. Only, a, only another 50 or so to go. And that's it. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Colin. We have time for a few questions. Oh, I, I bet. No. <laughs> so, Michael. No, oh, Michael, okay. Yeah, it's, it's merely a detail in one. Uh, yeah, here. Oh, sorry. Hi. Was, uh, <laughs> Uh, was I the first or somebody else uh, you're talking? First, you're first. No, no, go. All right. So it's merely a detail. In one of your slides, you said function available returns true when it's a private function. Remember yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. One sec. I don't think it should. I just, I just checked it in the spec, and <laughs> so maybe that is. Um, well, okay. If marked as public, then it returns true. But if if it's private then it should definitely not return true. Is, is that how you meant that sentence or not? Uh, I, what, 
I'll tell you what I saw, and then you can interpret it. I'll try and do it the other way around. Yes. So my, my functions were not marked as being public or private, because in XSLT2, we didn't mark our functions as any such thing, okay? True. Um, and so I then called the functions, function available, found them, and said, yeah, that's fine. You know, they choose before, off you go. And then the XSL evaluate didn't find them. Sorry, th then XL Evaluate failed? Yes. Yeah, because in XLT3, where XL Evaluate is available, um, when you don't give it a, a visibility, then it's by default private. Yeah. So that's, that's correct. But you also said that function available returns true whatever you use. But certainly it shouldn't. Yes, that, that, was, that was what I, I found. All right, maybe it's a bug. Yeah, possibly. Thank you. Michael? There'll be a rebuttal now. So. I think in, um, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't follow, I, I, I might, have, might have missed a step because I was trying to trace up on something you said earlier. But uh, um, at the end you're using, you're using function lookup. Yes. To look up a function whose name is in a variable. Yes. I think, I'm not sure whether this is true in your case, but I think 90% of the time if you're doing that, you're better off having the, having the variable containing the function rather than its name. So if you're, if you're holding function names in variables, yep. you're often better off holding the function in the variable okay. itself. So, so and I'm, then you don't I'm, need to look it up by name. Yeah, so I'm associating the function with the piece of content that needs to be run on based on the only thing that I could get from, from Office to do, which was to hide the function name in a comment. Um, because there's, I tried always processing instructions, custom elements. There's yeah. nothing you can do to XML that it won't throw away. Okay, that. But I, mean, I, that, I agree. That, but your point is, I could right. load up all the if, functions. If the function name is held in some external document, then that might, and outside the XDM yeah. space, then that that's probably the use case where it is justified. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Anything else? Any other question? No. Thank no. you again, well, Thank Colin. you very much. Thank you.